Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath once again. Although we're not in the house, all of us, God is still with us because we're told that wherever we are, he's there to dwell with us. So it's always a blessing. And I encourage you to set aside some quiet time because this is the Sabbath day and this is church time where we can focus on his goodness and his mercies. I just want to wish everyone again a happy Sabbath. I'm glad that, you know, it's a, it's a blessing to be here. It's a blessing to be alive. It's a blessing to be healthy. And um, this, these are things that I think before this pandemic we may have taken for granted. But I don't think we take it for granted anymore. You know, as I was preparing this message, I, I actually was planning on talking about something else. And... You know, I had my mind set on it, but I, and I prayed, you know, asked, asked the Holy Spirit for guidance. And the Holy Spirit says, no, I want you to talk about this. And I didn't really want to talk about it, but when the Holy Spirit speaks, you have to listen. So I, I, I ran across this quote that I thought was very interesting, and that's kind of kind of quickened my mind on this. It says that there will always be someone who cannot see your worth. The question is, don't let it be you. See, see, many feel inadequate or, or, or they come up short based on the world standards. We have so many people that are, are depressed and, 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 and they're trying to figure out how, how they fit in the scheme of things. But, but, but when you're thinking about this thing and you're forlorn and, and you're struggling in your mind regarding your worth, ask yourself, but who is my appraiser? Who is appraising you? The title of my message this morning is, What's Your Worth? What's Your Worth? I pray that at, at the conclusion of this message, you may view yourself in a different light once we get a perspective from God's holy word. I ask that you please bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for that, that this time uh, set aside to just go over your word. And, and I pray that you speak through me, that somebody at the sound of my voice may be blessed. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen, amen, amen. What's your worth? You know, I always ask the question of the value of you. How do you determine your worth? That's the question of the day. Well, is it based on the clothes that you wear? Do you have to have one of these labels to validate you? Or is it the shoes that you buy? And yes, by the way, these are real prices. Yes, that is $2.1 billion that, that was in the United em, uh, Arab Emirates. But anyway, is it based on the shoes you buy? Or the phone that you use? Hmm. Or the car? that you drive. Now, I'm, I'm not going to deny it. I would at least drive it, would mind trying to drive it at once. But does that validate who you are? Or is it where you live? Hmm, because I know my God says that he's preparing one of these for us. Well, you know, when you look at the music industry, you see the focus on what they endorse as validation of who you are. Well, it's interesting, browsing the catalogs of, of the, some of the world's most biggest you know, uh, artists in hip-hop since the 1990s, wealth has always been a dominant theme in music and in presentation. Though hip-hop uh, gets a lot of flack for the bling and the wealth that it speaks about, let's face it, most genres of music have go-to subjects that establish one thing, and that is status. Hmm. In hip-hop and rap, Artists provide an image that they assume others will want to aspire to be. Just like any other genre, wealth is important to hip-hop because many of its listeners come from backgrounds or are in situations where money is an issue. Hip-hop is not really middle-class music, and we see that all the time. See, here's the challenge. This world is fixated on stuff. We live in a world that is fixated on a temporal. Our worth is measured by what we possess. The more we have, the better life will be, they say. But is that really the, the case? Well, <clears throat> it's interesting how the various companies feed on our vulnerabilities. For example, Nike spends roughly $2.8 billion on marketing a year. You'll break that thing down. That's $8 million a day. 
that's $300,000 an hour or $100 a second. See, Apple does the same thing. They use a technique called, uh, uh, called exclusivity technique, which works by making eligible subset of, of customers sp feel special. This creates a better customer business relationship <clears throat> and is proven to increase brand loyalty. But, you know, but, but we have a tendency to take things to the extreme. Look at this, a shoe for a life. The number of young urban males who have lost their lives and, and exuberantly priced Jordan sneakers lines continues to astound. Recently, another victim was, has surfaced as, as in Washington area teen was shot and killed because of his brand new bright red Nike Air Jordans. His mom and police believe, you know, when, when, they, when they evaluated this thing, same thing in Cincinnati, a teen shot over his shoes. You mean to tell me shoes are worth more than a life, huh? But even in Detroit a few years ago, 18-year-old shot and killed over his brand spanking new Cartier glasses. Envious of what he has, more concerned about the stuff than the life. Well, the Bible says in 1 John 2.16, because I, <clears throat> I have to really evaluate this thing. i like, what is it that gets us so caught up sometimes? And the Bible says in 1 John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. It is not from the Father, but it's from the world. See, when you break this thing down, you re recognize that the devil has three avenues of temptation that he's been using with an incredible amount of efficiency over these years. Let's break this thing down. Matthew 4, 1 to 11, when we talk about the temptation of Christ, when he was ushered out into the wilderness, having fasted for 40 days, and he was tempted by the devil himself. We saw three instances. One, where he turned the stone to bread. The devil, or, or the devil tried to get him to tempt him to do that. You know, you know, you're fasting, but look, you need to eat. That's a necessity. That's the way we were created, or at least you were created to be, to eat. To, to sustain you, jump off the cliff. He took him up to a, a, a high cliff and he told him, look, be presumptuous, jump off. Your angels will catch you, look at who you are. And then finally, bow down and worship. Basically says, listen, he took him up and gave him a panoramic view of the entire world and said, I will give you all of this if you just fall down and worship me. And we all know that, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But <clears throat> the interesting thing about temptations is that a temptation is not a temptation if it's something you can't do. See, the challenge for Christ was he was capable of doing all of this. He's God. There was no limitations to him, but he was teaching us a lesson. We see that for, for, for turning the stones to bread, that was, that was acting on the lust of the flesh. That was the power to enjoy outside of the will of God. The lust of the flesh, which is preeminent today, but we see, it seems like the clothing that we once wore, if you watch a 1950s show, you know, everything's buttoned up and bottomed down. Now, everything is out and up, exposed, nothing left to the imagination. I don't have to imagine anything. I just turn on the TV. Oh, wow. Or get on my phone. I see everything I need to see or don't need to see. Jumping off the cliff, the pride of life, and we see the power to do Anything that exalts us above our station uh, and offers the illusion of God-like qualities wherein we boast in arrogance and worldly wisdom. Now we see this, the base, best example to me is the way our kids are educated and the, the medical and the scientific establishment has set up evolution as the standard of our origin. Now, now mind you, they haven't figured anything out. They have never discovered anything, but yet, they have completely done away with any of the creation or, or biblical account because they say that it's unscientific, unfounded. But yet, arrogantly, they tried to disclose how we came into being, yet there were no witnesses. Even, even for us Christians, you know, <clears throat> I had a, I was, you know, I used to do a lot of ministries and I used to go around and do presentations on antediluvian history and, and the pre-flood and, and, and creation and, all, and, and the flood and all that kind of stuff. And I was actually talking with this, this, this physicist. 
He was a professor at Ohio State University. This is when I was in Ohio. And we were going back and forth, and I said, look, I'll be honest with you. God didn't give me a playbook on how he did it. So for me, it's an element of faith. Even Adam was put to sleep when Eve was created. So he didn't know either. No man knows the work, inner works of God's work. But one thing I can tell you for sure is that you don't know either. Evolution doesn't have an answer because evolution can't account for point of origin. It can't account for, for where things, that, that, that initial. And, 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 we, and then we went bounced back and forth and he, I said, I answer one question and then I'll continue this conversation. He said, what is that? I said, in, your, in the evolutionary decalogue, explain to me where the names came from. Elephant, deer, dog, donkey. Where did it come from? In your evolutionary decalogue. After, after, after a few minutes of crickets, I said, well, we can end this conversation here. You believe what you believe in faith, in your, tech, in your, in your, in your uh, scientific methodology. I believe in my, what I believe in faith in my God. But that's not what I came here to talk about today. We're going to talk about the last temptation of Christ, which is bow down and worship. The lust of the eyes, the power to get obsessed with acquisition of stuff outside of the will of God. See, here's the issue. Satan has this world so focused on material possessions. We go broke trying to increase our value. We chase the Joneses before chasing Christ. We seek the temporal, but not the eternal. The Bible says in, in, in Deuteronomy 8.18, thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that gives power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant. Remember, I talked about how the, the, all the bling that, 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 that's demonstrated in hip hop and, and, and the wealth and the pomp, and they, they make such a big deal about it where they almost make you feel stupid if you're not a part of this thing. But also remember, just like with, with Christ, with, with, with the, the devil has the ability to give you stuff as well, but his has, comes with a catch. That's the only difference. See, see, look, 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 look how, how man has been so, so tempered and, and so inundated with the, with the possessing. This is uh, uh, in regards to Nike. We, sweatshops are common in developing countries. That includes Indonesia, India, Thailand, Bangladesh, Cambodia, where, <clears throat> where labor laws rarely are enforced. The film behind the swoosh exposed how workers, that's right, workers as young as 12, mind you, were paid a dollar and 25 cents a day. Not an hour, a day. But on average, it only cost the company $30 to make that shoe that we so are dying to have, must have. But yet, these shoes are turned around and sold between $100 and $160. But the condition of their workers, they're forced to live in slums near open sewers and share toilets, bath water, and, and with multiple families. But yet the company makes an annual uh, salary of roughly, or annual revenue of $30 billion. You don't, you're going to tell me that they can't do a little bit better with helping those that are helping making the product that are making them billions. We talk of that 1% mentality that is so prevalent here in the United States and also throughout the world. See, this is the challenge. Satan has worked continually to eclipse the glories of the future world. And this is the pen of inspiration. She says, and to attract the whole attention of things to this life. That's where our young people are right now. They're focused on this, the now. They're so inundated with what the rappers and, and, and the artists and, 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 and you know, the, uh, the sports casters, their lifestyle, that, that he's got us numb to the realities of what's, what's, what's to come. He has striven so to arrange matters that our thought, our anxiety, our labor might be so fully employed in the temporal things that we should not see and realize the value of eternal things. So the world and its cares have too large a place, while Jesus and heavenly things have altogether too small a share <clears throat> in our thoughts and affections. We should conscientiously discharge all the duties of everyday life, but it is also essential that we should cultivate above everything else holy affection on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, we see that the, the, the devil has us caught up in this world. He has focused on this world. 
It's interesting. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, but it is written, eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I find it interesting with all the bling and all the pomp and circumstance. Tell them to read Revelation 21, where God talks, about, where the Bible clearly depicts heaven, the splendor of heaven. We're talking about spang, and you talk about bling and, 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 and pomp and circumstance. Read those chapters. You know, 12 gates in a city, three in each direction, and 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the name of the 12 tribes of Israel. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The city was laid out in a square, a square 1,200 miles or 1,400 miles in all directions, huge, with walls up to 200 feet thick. Interesting. The walls were made of jasper. The cities of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were, were decorated with every kind of precious stone. And, 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 and we see that the 12 gates were, uh, were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of, of the city was, uh, was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. Now, I, I looked everywhere. I couldn't find one mis- municipality, one house, one mansion, nothing that had a driveway of gold. Nothing. But yet, they think the devil has us, have us thinking that this is it, that we got the bling. These guys are, are, are up there flashing and, 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 and dashing and, 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 and posturing and, and they're pompous. But yet, God says, no, I invented bling. I know what's going on. But see, see, so, so but, but that again has the question, well, what's our worth? Well, the Bible says in Romans 8, uh, 5, 8, but God shows his love for us and that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans of welfare and not for, eagle, not, not for evil to give you a future and a hope. See, even John 3, 16, that God loves us so much that he sent his son, his son. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more. Satan seeks to devalue us. But God's word is clear how much he really loves. See, see, man was, was, was to bear the image of God, but both in our, our, our resemblance and character, we are a special created, uh, creation. We were created with unlimited potential. Christ alone is, is, is express image of the Father, but man was formed in the likeness of God. His nature was in harmony with the will of God. His mind was capable of comprehending divine things. See, we don't study this stuff enough. We were a special creation, with, created with one purpose, not only because God loves us, but to repopulate heaven, because all the 130 the angels came with the devil, and the Lord was, there, there was something missing. The Lord says, I gotta, re, I gotta fill that back up, and I'm gonna make man so that they can come and join me in, 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 my, in my grandeur, in my bling and my pomp and my circumstance. But the devil is so busy. You know, I was on the line, and I saw this application. <clears throat> and, and, and they asked, you know, the application was, are you a, 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 a male or female? And I'm thinking, wait a minute. According to the Bible, yeah, I'm one or the other. But then they had the, the, he, the he, him, and, 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 and I forgot how it went. He, him, and something else. And then she, her, and then they had the she, her, and there. And, and I'm like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Back this thing up. According to the Bible, there's a man and there's a woman. DNA-wise, I have not found any DNA that has any transition. I'll leave that alone. So, we must understand that we're no afterthought. Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. See, we must realize our purpose and that's the problem. You know, when I talked about this whole binary thing and, and gender neutrality and all of this, that's just a stealth attempt to, uh, to dissuade and, 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 and murk up that image of God, to make it, make it blurry and, and who are we? That's why we're going through such an identity crisis in this country, in this world, because we, don't, we begin to wonder who we are. And if you don't read your Bible, you don't know who you are. You, you, you could be anything. You, could, you got people acting like dogs and, 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 and comic book characters and, 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 and you know, they just taking on the character of, of anything, any animate object. I, 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 that's what I am. I'm a tree. I'm, I'm, I'm a boot. 
You are a child of God. That's how he made us. So let's go to Luke chapter 15, verse 8 and 9. This is the parable of the lost coin. And this was our our, our, um, scripture reading for today. Oh, what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. See, this is an interesting illustration. This is one of three parables, uh, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the prodigal son, and this was kind of penciled in, in, in between. In this illustration, the sinner is likened to a valuable coin which has been lost. The woman does not take a lax attitude in, in, uh, towards her lost possession. No, first she lights a lamp, necessarily spending oil so that she can see clearly. Next, she, instead of simply glancing here or there, she uses a broom or uh, some utensil to sweep her house so that she can reach places that might otherwise be inaccessible to her. Above all, the, she searches carefully. There is no hint of indifference, only diligence. The coin was va- has, has value. She must find it at all costs. See, Jesus wanted the religious leaders to understand how he felt about those who are lost. When we are lost sinners, we are not just out there somewhere away from God. God longed for us so much that he took ultimate actions. He offered up his son as a sacrificial lamb. This he did to cleanse the sinner from sin and restore him to himself. He will go through any means, any expense brought, you know, know, before them to himself. See, when you understand the, the sacrifice that was made for man, then you begin to understand your value. And I'm gonna talk about that more in a minute. The parable of the lost coin indicates the mission of the son. Jesus came to be a light of the world, the true light that gives light to every man. Jesus provided the light to, for sinners to be found of God, just as the woman needed light to search carefully for her lost coin. Each sinner is special to God. There is rejoicing in heaven for each one that repents. We are all individuals of great importance to the Father. The woman could have been uh, content to possess the remaining nine coins. Obviously, they represented great wealth and status to her, but instead she searched carefully, unwilling to leave the chance that her coin might never be reclaimed, And and it was not sufficient for her to harbor this knowledge alone. Friends and neighbors must be told as we will share in this celebration. And finally, the parable of the lost coin gives a glimpse of that which the Lord delights. In this parable, once the woman has found the coin, she calls her friends and neighbors in order to share the good news. When a sinner is restored to fellowship uh, with God, it is a cause for rejoicing. This is the whole plan of salvation. That is why Christ came. This is the splendid, marvelous, most gracious act in the history of the universe. God seeks sinners, rejoices when they are found. He is not content for any sinner to be put away from him. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come together in repentance. We are of the utmost value to Christ. See, you have to understand the the great sacrifice that Christ gave up. That's why, and, and, and when you are questioning your value, Read, read the various verses. Read these verses. Matthew 10, 31. Fear not, therefore, you are more value than the sparrows. Isaiah 43, uh, verse 4. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples, in exchange for your life. Luke 12, 6 and 7. For are not five sparrows sold for, uh, for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God. Why? Even the hairs on my head, even my head. Most of it's gone, but it's still numbered. Fear not. Are you, you are of more value than many sparrows. God, remember that when God created man, when God created the universe, when he created, actually when he created earth in the six literal days of creation, he, after every day he said it was good. It was good. God loves everything about his creation, but there's something about us that's even more special. See, this is, this is, I asked this question before. Who is your appraiser? When, when you are, are, are struggling with your, your, your value, when you're trying to figure these things out, who is appraising you? 
God is our appraiser. The price paid for an object establishes its value. In fact, every buyer subjectively attributes worth to his or her purchase, and the purchase price reveals the buyer's personal opinion regarding the value of that purchase. He doesn't just declare it righteous, he makes us righteous. And what is the purchase price God paid to accomplish this goal? Well, we all know this. The precious blood of Jesus, that's the good news. His son, for when he came to, to, uh, when it came to our purchase price, this is what's interesting. God was more concerned about what he redeemed the purchased than what he spent. Do you recognize that when, when, when Christ came down in the, in, in the form of man, when he had the incarnation, that, you know, when, when, when he left here, he, first of all, he took on humanity to walk on this earth as a man. He wanted to be with us as a man. He wanted to live life as a man. He wanted to live life the same way of those he created because he, that way he could be a total and true advocate for us with this sin problem. And it's so interesting. I remember a few weeks ago, we were talking in the Sabbath school class and, and we were talking about the Holy Spirit. And, and there was a question, well, was the Holy Spirit that active before, before Christ? Because Christ did say, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I promise you the comforter. I'm gonna, when I leave, I'm gonna send the comforter. So that, that raised the question, wait a minute. Was the Holy Spirit always here? But, but Christ did say, I'm gonna send the comforter. Well, let me explain that. <clears throat> We all know that one of the sacrifices that Christ uh, gave up, again, was the ability to be everywhere at once. He gave up his omnipresence. He became a man. So he he knew that, listen, after my 33 years, once my, my sacrifice is complete, that I have to go back up to heaven to finish this work. And now that I'm a man, I'm not gonna be here with you. The comforter, because you, are, you have gotten used to being with me and you've gotten used to me dwelling with you on this earth. I'm gonna come back, but I have to go away for a little while. So while I'm up there, I'm gonna send the third person of the Godhead down. That's, that's my essence. So that way I can still dwell within you. I can still be with you, but I'm in heaven handling my business going about the investigative judgment. And, 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 but I'll be coming back. That's why the, that's why the angel said, why are, you, why are you standing here? And likewise, that you see the Father, the, the Christ go up, he's, coming, he's surely coming back. The fact of the matter is, he's gonna come back as a man. He's gonna always forbear. He's always gonna have the scars of, of, of this great controversy. He's always gonna bear the scars of this conflict, of crucifixion. He's gonna have the scars in his hand. He's gonna have the scars in his feet. He's gonna have the, 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 the scar in his side. That will be forever. That's what he gave up. And we talk about, I don't feel like I'm worth anything. Read your Bible. That's what God has done for us, that he gave up. And not only that, Man has, been, you know, man has been seeking to fill that empty void within himself that only God can fill. Man has been seeking to find his value and worth in all things, such as jobs and, and title and status and material gain and, and looks, family members, relationships, on and on and on, but only by the blood of Jesus. Only Jesus can give you what you're hungry and thirsting for. Like, the, like Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well, who was seeking value and worth and acceptance from men. I am what you're hungry and thirsting for. Come unto me, saith the Lord, and I will, will in no wise cast you out. I am that source of life that you are seeking. You won't need to find it in any other thing because I created a void that only I can fill. People we, we, we wonder, the world is run, wandering in darkness because they're not seeking God and, and, they, and they have this void. It's, it's something that's within all of us. That's why so many get caught up in stuff. That's why we have to seek a piano or, 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 or a chair. Something has to make us, to validate us. That's, but we don't know what Jesus has done for us. Read your Bible and then you begin to understand that, that, that I'm a special creation, the son of God. I, 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 I'm created with a special purpose. I'm more than that. I'm better than that. Covered by his grace. If we believe that you are more loved or, or valued by God than others, or less loved or valued by God than others, then your belief system is based on your works, not the finished work of the cross. See, to believe in Jesus means that you will put your faith and trust in his work 
not yours. See, we have to understand there's nothing we can do to make God love us anymore. There's nothing we can do to make him love us any less. The thing about it is, remember that he came down here and he endured major things, suffering, scoffing. Yeah, he, the devil was constantly in his ear. You came down here for them? Listen to them. They don't even believe you say who you are. Why are you doing this? Just, 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 just go, go back up to heaven. But Christ, he loves us so much. He says, no, I came down here for one purpose and one purpose only, and he, and he endured for us. See, that is how valuable you are, and the price for you has already been paid. You are worth the life of my son, says the Lord. Now enter into my rest because I love you dearly. See, see, we can understand the value of the human soul only as we realize the greatness of the sacrifice made for us, uh, our, our redemption. The word of God declares that we're not our own, that we are brought with a price, that it is an immense cost that we have been placed upon a vantage ground where we can find liberty from the bondage of sin wrought by the fall of Eden. Adam's sin plunged the race into hopeless misery. But, By the sacrifice of the Son of God, a second probation was granted to man. In the plan of redemption, a way of escape was provided for all who will avail themselves to it. God knew that it would be impossible for man to overcome in his own strength, and he has provided help for him. How thankful we should be in that a way was opened for us. You know, think about this. Um, You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is acknowledge your frailty and sin, Pray to the Lord, say, Lord, forgive me for my sins and follow his way. That's it. That's the good news. We make this thing so difficult. Well, I, I, I want to live, I wanna live like, like the, the rich and famous. I, I, you know, they got the bling. I want that. You know, the devil's, look, look what he's done. And they, they, trust me, young people, the hip-hop culture, you know, there, have, there are now people, just get on YouTube. There are now ex-rappers and people that have left that life because they saw how satanic it was. They, 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 they recognized that something about this ain't right. This, this, yeah, I got this, but, but, but people are sacrificing their kids and, and, and they're, eating, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're eating other, other dead bodies and, 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 and they're doing crazy stuff. For what? Where God has a place already for us. He says, I have already prepared a place. We are going to be going to heaven. The, the streets of gold. Streets of gold up there. They, what, what, the glory he has up there eclipses anything we can even imagine. The Bible was clear on that, that we, we can't even imagine what he has for us. But the devil was up there, and the devil doesn't want us going up there. So he's going to numb our minds and make us think that this is it, that this is the best we'll ever do. But as I always say, I can walk into a mansion today, and I can fall out from a heart attack tomorrow because I'm so excited for the mansion today. What's that doing good? What good is that for me? But when you go to heaven, mm, we go live throughout the seasonless ages of eternity. Zechariah 2.8, for thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent to me to the nations who plunder you, for he touches you, touches the apple of his eye. God loves us so much. We must believe in his promise. And and I'm going to pause here because this is kind of my appeal. You know, we, 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 we deal with a lot in this world. We, 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 we put up with a lot of mess in this world. We, 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 and, 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 and sometimes we even ask ourselves, but if you, when you look at the suicide rate that, that is sky high, where people are depressed and, 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 and not sure what they go, what, what's going to happen next in their life, and, and they're, they're trying to figure out, well, what am I going to do? Remember this, and I ask you, if, if, for anyone at the sound of my voice, I ask you to repeat these words after me. I am the apple of his eye. I am the apple of his eye. Repeat those words because that gives you value. You begin to understand this is what your appraiser says about you. I am the apple of his eye. Whenever the devil is whispering in your ear and he's telling you you ain't nothing and you ain't going to ever be nothing. You t- just like Christ a- 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 in the wilderness say, back up, buddy, because it is written that I am 
the apple of his eye. You remember when, it, when you're in a relationship and, and your husband or your wife or, or your boyfriend or your girlfriend is telling you, you, you you're worth this. You, 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 don't, you ain't worth the, the ground you're walking on. You say, back up, buddy. Back up, sister. Because the Bible says, I am the apple of his eye. I have value to the one that means the most. I have value to the one who made me, who knew me better than anybody, who knew me better than you, who knew me better than my mother, my father, who knew, who, who knew me before I was even created. See, there's no accident. You hear people talking about, well, this is an oops baby. There ain't no such thing as an oops baby. God knows everything. He knew you were coming. It was an oops to you, but God knew. And when you came into this world, you are the apple of his eye. Don't let anybody don't let any circumstance demean you, devalue you. That's what the devil wants to do. The devil wants to break us down mentally. He knows the power of those words because that will give us, the, 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 that will give us a sense of purpose of knowing, wait a minute. I'm not just a, a, a nobody. Yeah, I'm dealing with this thing, but God has the ability to change your situation because you are the apple of his eye. We are the apple of his eye, we need to understand and recognize that regardless of what we may be dealing with in life, if we pick up our Bible and we pray and ask the Lord to, to, to fill us with his Holy Spirit, not only will he give us a sense of purpose, but a sense of direction, and things might start to become clear. You, you won't start to saturate your life with stuff that's meaningless. Everything on this world is gonna burn, burn up at some point in time. Everything, anything man-made, Ha, 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 it will expire at some point. A car will get old after a while. A house will start breaking down after a while. Hey, even airplanes get old. They have to continue to maintain those things. Everything man-made expires at some point in time. But God provides things that are everlasting, that are things that are eternal. So you, 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 I, I encourage you all, at the sound of my voice, if you, if you whatever you're dealing with, if it's a relationship problem, if your, your body is, is racked with cancer or, or, or you just had a heart attack or, or you're suffering from some other, some autoimmune disease or, or, or you're in a bad relationship or, 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 or you're, not, you know, you're not sure, you, you, you're struggling with bouts of depression and, and, and you, you, whatever your situation may be, remember who you are. I am the apple of his eye. Fall back on him. Say, Lord, give me revelation. You made me, you know me, please be with me. So as I conclude this message, I want us to remember, first of all, that, that God has, has paid a, a very high price for us. He says, you know, you know, this is even going back to verse 29. We read uh, uh, Matthew 10, 31, but are two, uh, not two sparrows sold for a penny, ne yet not one of them fall to the ground outside of the Father's care. Basically, this verse is saying that there's nothing that happens even within his nature that is outside of his, his, his careful eye. Yet, he says, don't be afraid. You're worth more. He's paying attention to the birds of the field. He's paying attention to nature itself. I, you know, I always, always talk about this, you know, when we, when we um, get together and talk science. And I always ask, you know, the, the, the young people, I, you know, isn't it interesting that whenever we have uh, major issues that are going on, whenever, whenever we have like a natural disaster, you know, like, like, like a hurricane or, or a tornado or, or even earthquakes, you notice that there may be human casualties, but yet where's all the wildlife? How is it, why aren't they cleaning up uh, trucks of, of, of wildlife? This has been a, a traumatic situation. I don't get it. Well, because God is watching his creation, and he's even more so concerned about us. God loves us so much, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do you realize the sacrifice? Do you realize what he gave up? That's his son. You give your child up and see how easy it would be. It's not a simple thing. But because of his love for us, Again, we talk about paying that price. We talk about the, the, the appraiser. You know, I wish I would have, you know, the way people are, the value things. I wish I did have me original Batman comic book, original Superman comic book, 
or some of these other, or, or original uh, uh, a card of some guy who, who's dead and gone, but one, uh, uh, one uh, uh, you know, some sort of uh, Hall of Fame award or something, where they, people are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for that. that that's penitence compared to what the Lord has done for us. He suffered for our sins. 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteousness of the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. God left the, the splendor of heaven. He left the opulence and the bling of heaven to come down to this world, to live a life amongst us because he loved us so much, because we're the apple of his eye. He says, I'm not going to let anyone. I'm going to give everyone an, op an opportunity. Everyone is going to have a chance. To, all they have to do is believe in me. That's how simple this is. I'm not going to make them take tests. They're not going to have to pass some, some really grand uh, 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 a scheme, a schematic where they have to figure this out. Uh, you know, I think about my daughter went to, a, to a, uh, we call those escape rooms, where you got to figure out, how am I going to get out of here? Colds. And, he, doesn't, he didn't do that. All he said was, believe in me. I am Jehovah. I'm the Savior. I came to die so that all can be received into myself. We question ourselves. We wonder, what's my worth? Do you know your worth? Well, you think about anything that's bought in this world. Think about an auction. And you, and you have the devil, you know. I have a, we'll start off at $100,000. Do we have $150,000? $200,000. Oh, we got two hundred. Do we do, do we have $300,000? Uh, $450,000. All right, $500,000. 10 million. I'm out. That's how, the that's how it is. Christ was the one who took off his robe and said that my life is sufficient and I'm going to be the one to go and retrieve them. Why? Because they are the apple of my eye. Remember now, our value through his blood makes us priceless. We, we, we don't, don't, don't assimilate your value based on a thing, a car a house, a pair of glasses for life. We are the apple of his eye. Please bow your heads. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for just the privilege of coming to you, coming before your people today and, and encourage them, let them know that they are the apple of your eye, that you, that you came down and you, you, you sacrificed yourself for us so that we can be reunited with you and there's going to be a grand celebration when you come back and you step out of heaven and you say, okay, the Father says, now it's time to go get my children. And they come back down and, and, and you come the, when the, the clouds are parted away and, and, and we, we know that if, when you, he that shall come will come and you're going to come back. And, and what a day that will be. Lord, help us not to get caught up in, in the devil's scheme, trying to get us caught up in the stuff of this world. Yeah, you say Terry till you come, and you bless us even here because you say you give us the ability to gain wealth, but the devil can do that as well. Understand, it's all about perspective. Understand that this stuff is, doesn't mean anything. This is just a blessing here on earth, but you have an even greater blessing, which is up in heaven. You say, I go prepare a place. So thank you, Lord, for, for, for this, this message. Thank you for, Lord, words of encouragement. I pray that someone at the sound of my voice will be, will be lifted up and will recognize that, 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 that they are somebody because they're the apple of your eye. These things we ask in your humble and, and, and holy name of Jesus. Amen, amen.